All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. I see you chatting in there. Hey, Rodrigo from Brazil, uh, Elias from Norway, Lucas from Czech Republic, Jeff from down the street, <laughs> and another Jeff from Missouri. And we got David Fleming from the Iron Mountain. And hey, I'm Rob from Canada. How's it going, guys? Uh, I appreciate you all joining us here through the magic of the internet. Wow, global stream here, global stream. I guess I picked a good time for uh, even even some other countries, it looks like, uh, which is good. And we'll just wait to get started here. Let me know if you guys can hear me in the chat. I know there's a little delay. I picked normal latency on YouTube, so there's going to be like 30 second delay or something like that, just so it's like better quality. Uh, I noticed when I reduce the latency so I can chat more live with you guys, the quality of the stream definitely drops in, and same with the archive after the fact. Um, so there's going to be a little bit of a lag. So when you throw your questions in, it may take me a bit to see them um, or answer them. So just FYI. Um, sound looks good on my end. Uh, but you guys there, can you hear me? Audio fine. Hello from Portugal. <laughs> Diego, Diogo. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. I'm very bad with pronunciations. That's my thing. <laughs> horrible, horrible, horrible. Uh, but yeah, thanks for joining in. James, coming from England. Awesome. <laughs> I never had a roll call before. This is pretty cool. But yeah, I appreciate you guys being here. We're going to play through this, um, this Tainted Grail, like uh, the four page thing we unboxed yesterday, uh, the tutorial scenario. Um, and get a taste for the game. I've already played through it. I played through it last night. I figured it was a good way to kind of jump into the rule book. So I started it. I put it on the table, kind of rushed through it. Didn't really, didn't really spend too much time going through because I figured I'd be doing it with you guys today. So I kind of like half went through it kind of thing. Like I did the whole thing. Um, and based on what I chose yesterday at the end, there's like a little, um, kind of like you give, you get a choice. It's not totally scripted as I thought. There is actual option near the end that you can pick. And based on what I picked last night, I'll pick the other option and kind of see what happens. So we'll do that. Um, and yeah, we can go through both options too, just to see if you guys are curious. Um, but uh, then I read the rule book also a little bit last night with the wife. We put it up on the TV thanks to the nice high quality PDF that's been released of the rule book. Um, and we went through that and got to diplomacy before we had to pass out for bed. But yes, I've been reading the rules today, trying to get it wrapped around. So I've scheduled a live stream for tomorrow evening it's 8 p.m eastern time like toronto time i'm sorry it's like very late for some eastern countries um but you can always watch the archive later um but we're gonna start our campaign uh start the chapter one jump in we'll play with like the rules helping us to get started uh i'm gonna try to pre make sure we're really good for the to the start of it but it might be a little rough there is a lot of rules uh but there will be two of us playing to start and uh, if it goes well, we'll continue, obviously. Um, but we might also have Justin, who also plays with us on the channel. You've seen him in our Gloomhaven videos and our Too Many Bones videos. Um, he will probably be here on the weekend. So we might actually get some three-player uh, campaign stuff going on where he might jump in and, and come in mid-campaign kind of thing, maybe for chapter two or three or wherever we're at by that point. But stick around the channel. We're going to do some live. We'll probably do some recorded. So make sure you subscribe. Stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah, just making sure everyone's kind of here. Just giving people a few minutes to kind of show up um, for the live stream just to make sure they don't miss out. But I guess you can always watch it later. So we'll get started here now. All right. So let's jump down. Actually, let's jump. Yeah, let's jump down to the board here. So I switched over to the red mat, uh, which is basically just the other side of the mat on my table, the neoprene. Because uh, I figure it's a little more dark and depressing to kind of fit the theme of the game. Uh, versus the bright blue you saw yesterday when I was doing the unboxing. Um, but yeah, <laughs> something I figured I'd do. So this is the, um, the guide here we're going to go through, um, which has like a little story to it. It's all spoiler free, which is super cool. Um, and it gives you a taste, but then I've read the rule book now. And even at the end of this thing, it kind of recommends like, don't play the game unless you read the rule book. So it's like, it's cool they gave this to you. And I thought it was going to be more like a learn to play kind of like, Fantasy Play Games does where it's like, you know, a 20 page rule book or something that's learned to play. It gives you like 99% of the mechanics and you literally can jump in, fully play the game and only look in the rules reference, the second rule booklet when you have questions 
uh, for more complex things or weird things that only happen once every so often. But in this game, you can play through this, which is cool, but you still need to read the rules before starting the campaign. You can't just start here, this is like learn to play and then you're good to go. Not at all. There is a lot of little timings. There's nothing mentioned. This is only solo. So if you're playing with more than one character or more than one players, uh, there's lots about parties in there and stuff you need to know. Um, but yeah, there's this is like a good taste. This is a good demo of the game, I would say. And to kind of see how the game works. So like watching this right here with me, you'll learn some stuff. You'll learn how combat works. You'll learn how diplomacy works. You'll understand about spending energy for actions and that kind of thing. But you will not get all the rules here. This is not going to be like a, hey, watch this and you're good to play. You will need to read the rules, which are out there in PDF. If you don't have the game yet, I know a lot of you guys are waiting on copies. This I got as a review copy. I've seen some people kind of complaining that I have a copy and, and whatever. I, I've never heard of that before. Like this is the first game I've ever got where I've had like negative reaction from a company giving me a review copy. So I thought that was kind of weird. No other communities ever kind of lashed back at me for having a copy before they did, which I thought is kind of weird because this normal thing in the industry is like sometimes you get review copies ahead of time and it's kind of like out of the company's marketing budget to kind of promote the game. So thank you to Awakened Realms for sending this to me. Um, but yeah, I was kind of surprised at that. But anyways, most people have been pretty cool about this and are excited to see this playthrough on the channel, just like some of our other playthrough series. Uh, but yeah, all right. Uh... Elias, I feel it's a great entry for players who will not be the chronicler. Yes, actually true. Yes, they could play this. You could do this with somebody who's coming. Like, I'll play this 100%. I'll do this scenario with Justin, for example. What always happens is I'll learn a game. My wife will learn the game. We'll play together. We'll get our head wrapped around it. Sometimes even before we start recording a campaign playthrough. And then Justin will just show up on a weekend. And his time is limited. And sometimes I'll send him videos ahead of time to watch. So he's like, you know, up on the rules as best he can. But sometimes he just needs to play the game or see the game being played. And this actually is a great way for that. Like uh, Elias said, I probably would sit down with Justin uh, upstairs, you know, at a different table before he comes down and actually gets into the chapter we're on. I would say, hey, sit down. You're going to play through this. We'll walk through it together with you. And you grab the character. Here's how the, the bits work. It just it gives you a good taste of the game. It's true. But if you are the chronicler, the person who's in charge of the booklet, the bits, the decks, all that, the encounters, everything like that, um, it's the person they recommend in the rule book to pick one person to be that person so they they eliminate downtime so that somebody kind of keeps the game flowing and, and it's the person who has the books in front of them and all that stuff so you're not passing things around and, and having to wait. Um, but if somebody is that person, you need that person has to be like down on the rules, like know how everything works, including there's rules in the exploration guide they need to know. Um, not to mention the rule book, not to mention the FAQ, and the unofficial FAQ over at Board Game Geek has even additional entries and stuff that people have been asking already, which if I have any questions, of course, I will submit to there, um, as some others have asked. I think Elias, aren't, aren't you the one who put that together or is working on that? I'm pretty sure. Uh, the Board Game Geek unofficial, uh, it's in the forums at Board Game Geek on the Tainted Grail page uh, is where I found it, um, the unofficial FAQ. Uh, ba -ba. Tony. Hey, Tony, how's it going? Um, but yeah. All right. So let's get through to this uh, here. Uh, I don't need this because uh, like I like to do here, if the company provides it, uh, we will play with the PDF. So you guys can all read it with me, except for if the font's really small, like these, these documents kind of are. I'll try my best. I have it like on a nice 40 inch TV here off to the side that I can see, but uh, <laughs> kind of cheating a little. All right. Actually, I probably could make it bigger so we can read a little bit here. All right, so this is the start here guide. So it says, uh, it's a little story here. They still call this place a farm hold, even though barren fields provide little food and crumbling walls offer no protection. The last relic of glory days of Kunat, Kunat, I think it's spelt wrong here in this little story part because it's not the same way it's spelt on the, the, the actual pieces in the game. Uh, but it's Kunakt. I don't know. I'll call it the farmland. But anyways, it's uh, is its many year, always adorned with red ribbons, lit by candles, and with a daily offering at its gnarled feet. As long as the men here repels the weirdness, the townsfolk are ready to endure anything. But last night, the weirdness came closer than ever before. A man was lost, following the call of his future self. A house on the outskirts of town has turned inside out. Its furniture grown into a bloated outer shell, like barnacles on the side of a boat. For many hours, the air tasted of metal and sour milk. Now, people say your guardian, Minhir, is failing. 
like many others all over the land. For you, the night was even worse. The festering wound in your side throbbed as if something tried to tear itself free and join the rolling clouds of weird outside of town. In the morning, a boy comes running to your shack. Master Earfear needs you to see you. Move, you big goof. Uh, you chase the brat away with a well-aimed throw of a boot uh, and immediately start to regret it as the boot lands in a deep puddle outside your door. Uh, all right, so... That is our story part there. Uh, so let's just see. So this is an open and play glide. will help you set up and start your first single player adventure in Avalon and teach you all the basic game rules built for approximately an hour of play. It does not include any spoilers for the main campaign and also doesn't take into account raw blabbing with the chat for half the playthrough. So it may be longer. It's cool that they put that in there. <laughs> all right. So unpack your models. All right. So we got some models here. It gets you to pull out all the models, but I just grabbed the ones that we need which I should probably show you here. Okay, so I got the Menier. I picked up one of the Menier's. And we got one of the little coins that go underneath. And we got Bior. Uh, we grabbed him out, so he's here. To start, take your character models, one Menier model and one dial, octog octagonal plastic token, out of the box. The four characters are the characters available in the game. Unlikely heroes, ordinary people of the island, each carrying a taint that made it possible for them to join the party or made it impossible for them to join the party of champions that recently left their hometown. So Bjor, who we'll be playing with, is a local smith known for his short temper. He does his best to conceal a festering, unhealable wound in his side received under mysterious circumstances. And then Ailey is an outcast whose entire family perished in the weirdness. She makes a modest living supplying healing herbs and roots to the locals. And there's Maggot is a renegade of the druidic order whose innate powers are curbed by his destructive addiction and hallucinogenic mixtures and mushrooms. <laughs> Erev is a simple farmer with a not so simple past. He used to be a mercenary who bloodied his hands one too many times and now a mysterious curse follows him. I, I feel like Erev is the guy I want to play as, but I'm not sure. Like I want, I want to use the guy with magic when I get to the campaign. This is not this, we're stuck with Bior. But uh, I'm kind of, as I read the rules and read these little kind of descriptions, I'm like trying to think who I want to play in the campaign. Who's my wife going to play? I'll let her pick, obviously. Who's Justin going to play if he plays? And if we bomb out and fail in like chapter two or three and we have to start over completely, who will we pick then? <laughs> okay, so I know when you die, you can go pick somebody in the box that you haven't been playing with or you can do that whole um, kind of reach out to the gods to help you kind of reset to the beginning of a chapter, but we'll see. If it really starts going downhill and we start getting crushed right off the bat, we may restart the chapter. So that episode we do tomorrow night live might be like more of a learning chapter one where we see how it goes. But we're not going to play on the easy mode, uh, story mode that exists in the book. Uh, we're going to go with just regular play and see how it works out. All right. The hooded statue is the Meneer. Its origin and purpose will be revealed during your adventure, but for now, you should know that. You can only explore parts of the island in range of an active menier. Each menier is a space to hold a dial. These octagonal, octagonal, however you want to say it, tokens have several purposes. They count down to the moment the menier fades away and can be tossed. They can be tossed like coins and are used for many special rules. Uh, in this open and play tutorial, you play as Bior. Bior is high health and combat prowess can save inexperienced players from some of the mistakes they're bound to make on their first journey, while his crafting action provides decent starting equipment. See Bior's model, a man carrying a hammer. Check one Mior, or set Bior's model, one Meneer, and one dial in front of you. Place the rest of the models back in the box. Done, all right. Unpack the universal markers. Well, you saw that happen yesterday. So I have those here uh, in a little container on the side. Tons of cubes, more cubes than I've ever seen before, it's insane. Uh, all right, the purple markers, uh, that's these ones, which we don't, I think, need for this playthrough, but I have those here, you get a bunch of those. They count as five red universal markers. Uh, but you can leave them in the box for now, yep, says that. All right, so up on the right here, you guys can see that, can I scroll over? All right, so we take the blue character tray, which we have, okay? Uh, out of the box, you can find the full explanation of all icons on the character tray in the rule book. The most important part of the tray is the triple track used to manage your, uh, and we will go here. So here is the uh, track on your board. So you have energy, 
and you have these little on this blue board. So some of these are kind of a little different depending on the color of the board. But this one, uh, exhausted here on the energy side, is if you hit one or zero energy, you become exhausted. Uh, and he's starting energy, if you can see that there, has a little two red chevrons. Uh, that is actually a starting energy. And he's starting health, which is a second column, uh, where he could be dying if he's at zero. He starts at nine. Uh, it's got some bonus energy here. I'm not 100% sure about how that all works, but uh, I'll figure it out eventually. Uh, and then we got Terror here on the right, where this bottom one's kind of filled in. But he starts at zero, and he goes insane if he's in five or six. Okay, so that's what it's describing there. So your basic stamina, consumed by travel, combat, and exploration, that's the energy stuff. Okay, uh, it is regenerated each day as long as you eat food and rest. Then health, the second one I talked about, your physical condition, your energy can never be higher than your health. Whenever your health reaches the red zone, you're on the brink of death, and you attach the your dying card to your character tray. Okay, and then we have the terror here on the left, on the right, and we'll try to get it so you guys see that. So it's just describing it there on the right side. Uh, your creeping madness. Once it reaches the top, you start to go insane, making any actions difficult. Additionally, if your terror is higher than your health, you panic in combat and diplomacy. So in the unboxing, I mistakenly, after reading half the rules, I said if your uh, terror goes above your uh, the little health uh, token thing, uh, you have nightmares. But that's, it's not correct. You only have nightmares, I believe, if you're going insane. Uh, it's, yeah, I was totally wrong there. But, uh, yeah, if your terror is just above, it's that whole, uh, you just have to deal with panicking and combat and diplomacy if it goes above the little, the little marker. All right. So now it's saying, uh, trying to use the mouse left-handed here. Set up my character. All right, so we're gonna do that. Okay, so take yours, character tiles shown above. Turn the tiles so the setup side is face up. So I'll show you guys this. So on the other side here, you have the whole how to set up a character. So there is at the end of the rule book, I saw there's a free to play thing uh, where I wasn't sure when I was unboxing it, but now I understand that you could play anything goes mode where you literally take any one of these um, characters and use them with any board and then you even like you get the cards from that board and you mix them and then you can like kind of build decks and do unique combinations and stuff and you can even use characters from future sets but then it says obviously you can't do any personal story stuff if the character doesn't exist in that campaign which totally makes sense but yeah it's kind of cool so you can spice it up some more replayability options I thought it was kind of neat but obviously to start they kind of make blue color goes with the blue um, the blue dashboard basically so uh, you turn the tile set upside, and then it instructs you how to prepare the blue character tray for Bjor. So first, uh, let's mark the starting level. It says so we're going to do the starting level. Where is that? Uh, attributes. Oh, okay. Place the red markers in the attribute slot. Sorry, I lost where I was in the sheet. So he is two in aggression. I'm going to put these little red cubes in here. And, of course, they're going to stick to my hand and fall all over the place. <laughs> Live video is fun. All right, so here we got uh, two aggression. We got one in courage. Now the cool part is these work in pairs across here. So these little, uh, on this side is your combat um, skills. And he's got one practicality. And they match your diplomacy skills on the other side. So they come in pairs. Grant, thank you for subscribing. Much appreciated. Uh, on the other side, he's got one caution here. But these go in pairs, so it's kind of neat that he, to start, Bjor, is very aggressive, but has like no empathy. And the cool part is these come in pairs, like aggression and empathy are linked together. So when you're trying to upgrade empathy, the more aggression you have, the more expensive it is to upgrade empathy. Obviously, that's also the more to upgrade aggression, but you could really go heavy on aggression. But if you try to just go get one empathy, you're going to pay a couple extra XP for each point you have in that other linked stat. So let's say he was like had no courage, he'd probably start going up in caution maybe, but you can have, it's kind of cool how they're linked. So if you're really uh, full of courage, you're obviously going to have less caution in uh, di diplomatic uh, challenges and that kind of stuff. So I'm curious if like story links to that, I'm pretty sure it does, but uh, obviously I haven't gone there yet. Um, but then practicality links with spirituality. So that's kind of cool. Uh, practicality has got one, but spiritual, spiritual, <laughs> I can't even say it. Anyways, he doesn't go to church is basically what that's saying. All right. Uh, so that's his starting, um, attributes. 
And the other thing it says on the character tile, uh, oh, we'll do his starting energy, which we said was six, starting health of nine, which we don't put a red marker in there. We actually use this cool little thing, uh, which is like a little T-shaped thing they were mentioning before. It kind of clicks in there. And that keeps that little T bar there to keep it so your energy never goes above that. And then it also reminds you if your terror goes above that, you're then panicking in combat and diplomacy. Uh, so he starts at zero on the terror. He's not scared yet. Uh, starting resources, we get three food and three wealth. Okay, so we put little cubes in there. And sorry, one wealth, one wealth, three food, one wealth. Uh, let's see what else they say here in this PDF. Just make sure we have it all done. Ba, 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 ba. Find the T-shaped thing. Place a marker in the starting health slot. Yep, we did that. Find energy. Okay. Look for the two red chevrons. Yep, we did all that. We just talked about that. All right, we're going to page two. So like it says here, finally place three red markers in the food slot and one red marker in the wealth. Done. Now we insert the tile into the tray. So they're saying flip it over, get rid of all your starting stats. You don't care about that anymore. So we're going to flip it. Oh, we should look at his abilities here. I don't know if it's asking us to do it yet, but we'll look at them. All right. So his abilities, Bjor has this craft ability they mentioned already. So for energy on this thing, you'll draw th three random craftable items and pick one, but it's only when you're in settlements. Uh, but that's kind of cool. Uh, we're not going to deal with items. That's another thing they left out in this tutorial is like no items, none of that stuff, no spoilers of any kind. So it's kind of sucky. You don't get to deal with that stuff. So like I said, you need to read the rule book because there's way more cooler aspects of this game that you will not get here in the start here guide. That's for sure. Uh, festering wound, lose one health every time you become exhausted. So that's his negative ability. And that craft is obviously his positive one, but each character has this kind of like positive and negative ability is my understanding. Okay. So that's done. Uh, oh yeah, it does say, please note his abilities. Whoa. All right. So unpack the open and play deck. Let me just get that plastic off. Okay, done. All right. Uh, your box contains specially marked 35 character or 35 card deck. It includes all standard size cards you will need in this tutorial. Find and open this deck now. Please do not shuffle it or alter its content in any way. You've been warned. All right. This also doubles as the saved encounters divider. <laughs> so that's gone. All right. So this is all in order. It gives you 15 combat cards, 15 diplomacy cards, all sorted one through 15, obviously. Uh, and they are actually the cards that Bjor will use in the regular game uh, with the rest of his cards that he has in the box. But they give you a good taste and get you started. So combat will be on the left side of our board. And we'll throw Diplomacy on the right side. Normally, I think you'd have to leave some room for some skills eventually when you upgrade them. But for now, we're not going to be doing the skill stuff either. Upgrading uh, attributes and that kind of thing. So that's another advanced thing you're going to want to read the rule book for. All right. Set up Combat and Diplomacy decks. So remove the top card from your open play deck. Below, you can see your Combat deck done. Uh, diplomacy deck done. <laughs> going a little ahead of myself here. Set up your Encounter decks. All right. This is, this is very complicated here. The last remaining open and play cards are the four encounters, each of different color. Place them to the side, face down. Your first encounter text should be face up. And we'll go up here in the middle column of the PDF. All right. In a standard Tainted Grail game, you'll be asked to set up the encounter decks for each chapter. The green deck is mostly used in the wilds and contains natural threats such as wild animals or legendary beasts. Many of them give food. Yum, yum. All right, the gray deck contains dangers related to the world of man, such as brigands and people driven to insanity by the weirdness. Many of these encounters gives items or wealth. The purple deck contains supernatural threats. You'll have to discover the significance yourself. The blue deck is where you'll find non-combat challenges that may happen every time you visit a settlement. They are resolved using a special diplomacy deck. However, in this tutorial, each of these decks will contain only a single card. Super complicated to set up these decks. You do this, and this, and this, and this. Boom! We set up the decks. But in the regular game, you'd be using a setup card that would tell you what to grab, what encounters, mix in this many, random, and that kind of thing. So usually, there's some setup time I, I see to chapters after reading the rulebook, kind of like preparing all the different decks. 
with like different difficulty levels of enemies and that kind of stuff. So that's kind of cool. But in this tutorial, they made it super simple where you're just, the decks are one card each, <laughs> uh, which is neat. And they even say in the normal game, if it's your first time playing, which we might do on our stream tomorrow night, you put these on the top of the decks just as your first because they actually have like rules text on them. We'll see in, in a second. All right, so take seven starting location cards. Find a deck of oversized cards in the box. These large cards are locations you will explore during the game. Each of them contains an action on the front, and each may be explored, revealing the story and additional interactions on their back. Take locations numbered 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, and 107. Set them aside. This is your locations for the tutorial game. Boom. Done. All right. Now we're going to set up our starting location and try to make it fit on video nicely. So I think we put it here-ish. Maybe here-ish. I just want to have some room down here to do my uh, encounters at the bottom so you guys can see it a little closer to the camera. All right. So place the farm hold location 101 here in front of you. The Quanact. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but I'll try my best. <laughs> this is your home. Place your character model on this location card. Boom, we're home. All right. Then place the men here on the location card. Put a dial on the base of the men here so the number eight is at the front. This men here will go dark eight days from now. All right. So we'll throw a little eight under here. Where is eight? Now thoughts is probably, I mean, I don't care too much for this tutorial scenario, whether you guys can see it or not. George A. from Cyprus, thanks for joining. <laughs> the whole world, one person, we have representatives from many, many countries, which is awesome. All right, and hello from Canada. All right, so you can't see that. I know you can't see that. I can barely see that that's an eight. And I can see in a game where there's a bunch of people around the table and you have a bunch of those on the board and they kind of only can be seen from one direction, that might be a little troublesome. So I picture a lot of people saying, yeah, the menus are cool, they look nice, but I can see a lot of people start playing with like dice just to signify like 12-sided dice or something, um, which I thought of. I don't know if it's easier to see on video, but I might do this for the playthrough or something similar. I have green ones. These are from us playing Lord of the Rings LCG. Uh, let's see here. How much does that stand out? Can you guys see that eight there? I don't know. I picture like using D12s to kind of, just so on video people can follow along and see what it is. Even if I shove it in there, maybe you can see that. Denmark, Martin, thanks for joining us. Uh, all right. Let's move away. But yeah, anyways, I might do that and just use some, a uh, little side note, obviously nothing to do with this tutorial, but welcome to Rob's live streams where he kind of just goes on tangents. Uh, all right. So anyways, it's on eight here for the, for the tutorial, but I'll check that footage out later and see how that dice looks, or the die the die looks, and whether I use dice or not. Okay, so that menu is there. Okay, where were we in the PDF? Let's see here. All right, whenever you reveal a new location, make sure you familiarize, familiarize yourself with the action on its front. For example, Quanact allows you to earn some reputation once per day which, and we can see that here, let's go. So you can see here we have the name. This symbol, as it says in here, is dreams, mean that spending a night in this location reveals either a dream or nightmare. This means it's a settlement, this little house symbol. If it's green, they're friendly. If it's red, it's, it's not friendly. <laughs> and this symbol means there's a many year that could be put here or is here right now, can be activated, that kind of thing, or reactivated or whatever. And here's the ability. So for one energy, chores for the townsfolk, you can gain one reputation once per day. And then you have some little flavor text here that kind of like gives you an idea of what is happening on here, but like that art, man, that art is, is like top notch. I love it. I can't wait to see like a whole bunch of them, like a really big map going on to kind of see the different cool stuff that's later in the deck. Uh, its history as vast as its its history as vast as its graveyard. Its future as empty as its houses. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so depressing. I love it. <laughs> P 
paint the numbers bright red. All good. Yeah, I was thinking that too, like, or yellow or something, just like getting like a small paintbrush, uh, like a miniatures paintbrush, you know, and then like just painting on there. So I might do that. I'll try on one and we'll see how it looks. And we'll test that on stream. We'll see. But I'm worried like that I don't spill paint like and ruin these pretty, pretty dials, but we'll see. So now I gotta find an eight again. All right. Okay, so that is the farm hold. So let's throw this guy here somewhere. Okay, uh, what else do we need to know? Additionally, take note of the three symbols. Yes, we already talked about that. Okay, I think that's it for that column. So we're going up in the top right here. Build the starting map section. All right, it's time to expand your map in a standard game. Whenever you travel to a new location, you will attach new location cards to its sides, matching their keys to the keys on the edge of your location. So that's little arrows on the side. And if you guys play Seventh Continent, you know all about this stuff. Uh, so let's see here. So 102 goes up here. Oh, it's actually saying attach 104 first. Attach charred conclave. Oh, also important, you'll only be able to attach locations that are adjacent either directly or diagonally to a location with an active minier. So for now, we're doing 104 down here. Nope. 104 to the right edge. Because you can see this 101 points into card 101, which I should have looked at instead of following the instructions. So 102 is up here because it's pointing down at 101. Uh, it wants us to do 103, the warrior fair. Uh, that's kind of cool. And next is 105 to the bottom edge, the forlorn swords. So looks like something straight out of Dark Souls. Uh, and attach the Hunter's Grove to the top. Done. Leave locations 106 and 107 in the location deck. Your character will reveal them later. Whoa, spoilers. Ruin the whole freaking scenario for me. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Help cards and rule book. So I've set those up here. You guys can kind of see them down here. I'll kind of be blocking them. They're really small text. I'll hold them up if we need to look at them. Um, but there is one for combat and diplomacy icons, combat overview, order of the day. And on the back, we got action overviews, diplomacy overview, and we got icon glossary and character advancement. So good little references for sure. And lots on them, nice and small. So they won't take up too much table space, but they're on oversized cards, which is cool. Uh, and it's saying our setup. So we need to double check it. it should look like this. Uh, well, it doesn't. Let me just Let me just fix that. There we go. All right, it wants us to have our cards tilted like this. I'm only kidding. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> that's it, it says. Uh, a standard game of Tainted Grail makes use of many other components, such as story event cards that provide you with quests or the chapter set of cards. However, for this tutorial, everything you need will be found in this brochure and in the tutorial exploration journal that will be referenced later. If you haven't yet read the story introduction at the start of this guide, do so now, then go to the next page and start your journey. So we did read the little guide at the front already. And check on the chat, see what's up. Um, so Jeff Wells says the dials are the first things he plans on painting. And Matthew Craig says, that's what I'm planning to do. Dials first, super highlighted numbers. Yeah, I was thinking that. And then like I, for video I'm caring about, but then I'm just thinking like people around the table, it's gonna be tough to see that stuff. So yeah, it looks nice. Definitely will sell a game on Kickstarter for sure having cool minis like that but sometimes it's not practical um yeah if it just like kind of hampers the game makes the game take longer or, you know that kind of thing it might not it might be cool the first time you play but then after you kind of just like throw it to the side also depends how long the game takes too all right at some point i'll try to build the whole island with all the cards <laughs> yeah yeah you get tempted to do that stuff for sure in these kind of games but you gotta wait like let it let it happen during the game right um as best you can no exploration cards in this game. No, there's not. Uh, so in, in this tutorial, uh, there you normally, in a game, you would flip cards over as you explore, and they give you stuff on the back, and also in the journal. But for this spoiler-free tutorial chapter, everything is referenced in this PDF we're looking at here, or in the back, in this exploration guide, they actually have just a section in the very back 
called the Tutorial Exploration Journal. So it's like just little two pages here to give you everything you would need, which would normally be in different sections or on different cards and stuff, all just in that one two pager. So you don't spoil anything doing this. So it's like the perfect demo scenario for sure. So you're not going to ruin anything. All right. Part one, start of the day. So we're going to get to some gameplay-ish here. Uh, it's now, now dawn. Bjor is ready to start his journey. Before you first start the day, start of, before the first, your first day, <laughs> before your first start of the day routine, follow the order listed on the green help card. Boom. Green help card here. So this is one of the reference cards. You can see it up close there. So they have the whole start of day, during the day, end of the day. And on the back of this one is your action overview. So to remind you of the actions. And they have one of these for every player. Same with um, the icon reference sheet. So this one is your combat and diplomacy icons. Enemy traits are all down here. And your icon glossary. And your cost for character advancement when you're upgrading their skills and whatnot. When, you have, when you've actually obtained some experience. But then they only give you one of these combat overview reference cards in the box. And on the back is diplomacy overview. So mainly when it's happening, you know, you can pass this one around, no big deal. And if you're playing solo, like obviously that doesn't matter. But everyone gets these two, but only there's one of these. At least in my box, that's how it came. Um, okay, so they're saying deal with the card, the green card. We're going to do start of the day. So first asked us to remove the expired menus and discard locations that are out of the menu range. Well, that's not happening because we're good. There's no expired menus. But normally you would check that now, you'd take them off the board, and then it would go dark and you'd remove whatever uh, locations are within the one range around it if they're not also lit up by another menu that's adjacent to them. So you'd clean them up off the board. And if somebody's on them, on a tile that goes away, like a card that disappears, they take some damage and kind of move to the next card that they can get to. Uh, so you need to light those menus. If it's your last menu on the board, there's some whole mechanic where it's like it goes away and then you start losing two health and gaining two, her two terror a turn, I think, for characters until they can get it lit up or until they die, basically. So it's kind of the, the timer's on when that happens. So you got to keep those things lit. Super important. Uh, okay. So then we have reduce all time and menu dials and then remove time tokens. Well, there's no time tokens, so we're going to reduce our dial down to seven. Okay, they do this and they explain it in the rule book. I've seen people asking about this. They say, why would you do that right now? Why wouldn't you just start the dial on eight and leave it alone the first round like a lot of games do? A lot of games will skip the event phase at the beginning of the game or skip this on your first turn, round, wave, whatever. Uh, but in this game, they want to keep it sim simple. So every single time you're in the start of the day, you're just following this like a robot. You don't even have to think about it. You check, you do this, you clear that, you you, re you, you do your dial down. None of that. In, if it's your first time, the, the rules change. They just want to keep it simple. So we're going to do that. Uh, and then you reveal the next event card. But in the PDF, we're going to see how they've adjusted this. So they okay, first ask you to remove expired menus. Obviously, we're not going to do that. Uh, now reduce the menu dial by one. It should show the number seven. Help card also mentions time tokens, but there are none in play right now. Okay, where is my mouse? In a standard game, you would now reveal an event card, but this tutorial has its own event card printed below. Read it. So normally you have little event cards, like they're, they are, I can grab them here. Uh, Okay, so there's your items. Oh, sorry, event cards are bigger. I'm being dumb. Um, that looks like a small card, but it's actually a bigger card. And it's in a pile of a bunch of cards. I'm not going to grab it. But normally, you have events, and there are specific events per chapter that you'll build like an event deck. Um, but it's just going to give you this here. And sometimes they have quests on them, like this one. So you'll speak with Kunat's blacksmith, Erfir. Hint to meet Erfir, if I'm saying that right. Erf Erfire? Or fear, you have to explore the Kanat farm hold location. And then it says there are no guardians to move, so you don't have any, and you don't have any items, so you can skip the remaining start of day steps. Which normally, right here, move guardians, which you'd be rolling a die to do that, and then picking active items and secret cards. So that's when you pick 
um, your equipment, which is a cool thing. I wish they kind of gave you that in this tutorial just so you could see it. Um, but I guess I don't want to spoil like not even like what armor is in the game or any of that kind of stuff. But normally you'd pick like kind of like in any other game, like Gloomhaven, let's say. You'd be able to equip like, you know, hand item and something on your head, something on your body, something on your feet, all that kind of stuff. This has a similar thing where it's like one armor item, a relic. You're only allowed to have like one of each type. Um, but those are the items you take in. You could have extra ones, but when you go into an encounter, you would only pick like what, what items and what weapons and all that kind of stuff you're going to equip kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's where I guess you pick your active item and secret cards. All right. Part two, first exploration. So this is really hand holding us here. At the start of the day, characters may perform actions. Each action in Tainted Grail is marked with a special icon, also shows its cost. So it's like that symbol right there. Let me show you guys. Oh, okay. Let me pull it over to the left here. So right here, uh, his first his first action, Bjor should visit Urfir. To do so, explore the Kunat Farmhold location. To initiate this action, pay one energy. Move the marker down on your energy track. Okay, done. Um, in a standard game, exploration would direct you to text on the other side of the location card. But this tutorial won't spoil any story for the campaign. Instead, go to the tutorial exploration journal printed on the last page, page of the exploration journal book. There, find the appropriate section 101 Clonaut Farmhold and start reading. So we are going to do that. So here at the back of the journal, let's go. All right. So right here. Quinault Farmhold 101. So we're going to read this section out here. I'll read it to you guys. Uh, exploration journal entries for most locations in Tainted Grail start with an introduction that leads to your decisions. Read the location's introduction first. So I think normally this is on the back of the card, but they've kind of done, they, they usually also put it in the journal. So you, if you have like stuff on the card, you don't have to flip it and read it. If you have a whole bunch of tokens and everything to kind of keep the game flowing, you can just literally say, I want to explore this. And you just go to the book and it'll have everything there that's on the back of the card. Plus more, obviously. Um, a deep feeling of loss pervades Kunat. From dilapidated farms to sunken eyes of those who remain in town, the many are in the market is nearly extinguished. Still, this place is only home, the only home you ever knew. Now some rules text. Now you're ready to choose what to do in this location. Below are two options redirecting you to different verses. Paragraphs also, uh, aka paragraphs. Each has a requirement. The first time you come here, you're able to choose the first option because the second one requires a specific part of a status or a story trigger marked on your tutorial save sheet. If you're here for the second time, you should already have part two of the required status, so only the second option is accessible to you. So, how that's gonna work, and I printed it out here uh, just for fun, but let me find the regular save sheet. So they normally give you this giant pad of save sheets, like 30 of them in the game. But on the back, similar to some that were I printed out, we did had in our Gloomhaven playthrough, uh, you kind of, as you find things in the story, you, you get those statuses. So for the tutorial sheet, we can only get surprising Aaron one and, uh, one and two. So we'll mark these off as we go uh, to track that it's being done. But on the back here, as you can see when you play through the campaign, like, you, you may get some of these, you may get none of them, you may get all of them, whatever, but you'll need some to trigger different things and stories and it'll lead to, I guess, branching paths, different harder challenges, easier challenges, that kind of stuff. But that's pretty cool that they, they have. Like, that just shows you how rich this is going to be. Um, but yeah, so we have that. All right. Uh, so we're going to make our choice now. So they give you here the options. Let's see here if you can see that. Make your choice now. So we're going to speak with the master only if you don't have any part of the surprising errand status. You go to verse one. But then the next part is complete your mission, which obviously is not going to happen now. Obviously. So we're going to read part one or verse one. Urfir is up earlier than usual. As you enter, he hides a large pack behind a curtain and turns to you with a wide smile. You hear, lad, good. Hope you're ready to stretch your legs a bit. Uh, I hear a star fell near whitening. And a local tanner picked it up. It's a solid ingot, large as your dingy head. <laughs> I'd rather not have it fall into the hands of some other smith. You nod. Falling stars are a bad omen 
for most simple folk, but they always excite blacksmiths and armorers. After all, the legendary Excalibur was forged from one of these cold shards of distant skies. Soon, you depart, walking down the slopes of sloping fields towards the mist-covered forest with some rations for your trusty hammer and a purse of silver Ephir gave you. Before stepping into the shadow of the trees, you take one last look back at the ancient statue towering above shacks and houses. How much longer can this tired old thing protect Kunat? Gain part one of the surprising Aaron status. Gain one wealth. So we're going to gain a wealth. And the exploration ends. So whenever you read exploration ends in the journal, boom, you kind of like close the book, get out of here, go back to where you were. That is one complete exploration. So it will usually tell you stop, basically. That's what that means. Stop reading. You're done. So we're getting part one, right? Let's double check here. My little hand hold is here. So we start reading. Oh, right here. Go back to part three. Your exploration is now finished. Okay. So we have a new task. So we are going to mark off that we got number one. Okay. Did it. Halfway there. Sort of. Okay. So your exploration is now finished and you have a new task. It's time to start moving Bjork towards its destination. The cursed farm hold known as the Whitening, as you know from the exploration journal, the Whitening is northeast of your village. To plan the journey, let's study all revealed locations. To the east is the Charred Conclave, a dangerous place that will trigger an automatic encounter as soon as Bjork enters it. And that is the rule marked with the little lightning bolt icon, which would be draw a gray encounter card when you enter this location once per day. And there is a bad looking dude there that I don't want to deal with. So we're not going to do that. I don't think. So the north is the Hunter's Grove up here. Uh, where Bjork can gather some food. This looks better, doesn't it? So here it says you can spend two exploration to gather. Or, uh, yeah, two, sorry, energy, two energy, sorry. To gain two food and draw one green encounter. And it says in ages past, only the druids were allowed into the grove for good reason that is now forgotten. Okay. Bah. All right. So that one looks better, doesn't it? Yeah, of course. Perform the travel action. So you pay one energy. So we're down to four and move him to the Hunter's Grove. So he's going to leap over this menu, do a flip and he lands there. All right. As you arrive there, check if there are any locations connected to the Hunter's Grove that you could reveal. You may reveal any locations that are connected to your current location with direction keys. And the numbers on the edges of the card. For more information, see page 10 of the rule book. In range of the active menu. So they have to be adjacent and in range. So as the rule book shows an example. So here we're going to put four dweller mounds on the left side. And then we're going to slap the whitening, which we knew was to the northeast on the right side. But we obviously don't place the one that is adjacent to the north because it's out of the range of the menu that is lighting up one range around it, basically. Uh, all right. So saying it has to be in range, either in adjacent straight line or diagonally to a location with a menu model. In this case, you attach locations 106 and 107 to the sides of the Hunter's Grove. Both meet the criteria mentioned above. Do not attach location 113 to the top of the Hunter's Grove, as it would be too far from your only menu. And part four. First location action. Bjor's new location has an action. Gather food. Food is an important resource uh, that you consume at the end of each day, so gathering more won't hurt which we have three right now. Uh, to activate the location, pay its two energy. Let's do it. One, two, down to two. Uh, where was I? Bjorg gains two food. Take two markers and place them in the food slot. Done. We now have five food. Okay, take the green encounter card. You place near the map during setup. Place it face up so you have plenty of free space to the right of the encounter card. So, encounter time. So, we're a green encounter, it said. Yep. Gain two food, draw one green encounter. So, let's deal with an encounter. So, we got this cool thing, the uh, mist shape vermin. And it's got all the rules on these. These are like your first, my first encounter cards, you know. Like, you give these to like a three-year-old. Here's your my first encounter cards. <laughs> all right. Encounter value. You need this many red cubes to win right up here. And that's, that's like basically hits in your combat pool. Attribute keys. 
place the first card you play here. So it's going to attach and kind of link up to these keys with arrows pointing this way. Combat pool. Every gained red cube goes here on the left. And you can't call yourself a true adventure until you've killed one, <laughs> is the flavor text. And basically, there's your combat table. The number of red cubes determines the enemy's attack. So if we have red cubes in his pool from 0 to 2, he'll do 1 damage to us on his turn. If we have 3, we'll lose a red cube. But if we have 4 or more, we kill him. And on an opportunity, that means if you don't play any cards on your combat turn, it will trigger an opportunity and run away. And the loot you get is one food. All right, so that's what we're fighting here. And let's see. <laughs> and Matthew says, I can't wait to get my hand on this game. And Elias agrees. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Hopefully this is making your wait better, but it's probably making it worse. I'm very sorry. <laughs> okay, so... Um, we're going to do some combat. So it's saying, read the encounter card carefully. You win. You need to gather a number of markers in the combat pool equal to or higher than the encounter value, which I've explained already. To gain these markers, you play combat cards from your hand. Prepare two help cards, one with the combat overview and one with the combat and diplomacy icons. Done. Okay. Uh, now, let's go through your first combat step by step, following the combat overview help card. Remember, if you want to know more, you can find de detailed descriptions of all cards and icons in the combat section of page 14 of the rulebook. And let me show you, it is very detailed. Right here. So in the rule book, it is literally going to go over everything about each card, go through examples, go through all the special rules it's not going to deal with here. What happens in a situation when you have negative combat pool, you have an empty hand, you're dying, you have no cards left in your deck, all that stuff is described along with an example. Very, very cool, very helpful. I like it. So you'll see that all in action eventually on the channel for sure. All right, so we're going to draw three cards from our combat deck, which is predefined, has not been shuffled. We should have cards one, two, and three. And the numbers are in the bottom right here. One of 25, two of 25, three of 25. And it is the attack, reposition, and ignore pain cards. Okay. If you did tamper with the deck, you may recreate it by sorting viewers' combat cards from one at the top to 15 at the bottom. Card numbers are located along the bottom edge. Cool. You don't have to check the encounter's trait. It has none. Oh, that's the other thing. Yes, sometimes they will have traits. So first here, starting an encounter. You draw three cards from the combat deck. Four characters. If you're playing with four characters, you only draw two cards. Then you check enemy traits. So enemy traits are all on here. So it could have ambush. First character is discarded down to one card in hand. Rush, first character receives two damage. Defensive, all these, so there's like a whole bunch of stats here and uh, that it could have. But in the tutorial, there are none. It's basically just a little mouse that we're gonna step on here. All right, so then we pick the active character. Well, we're playing solo, so it's me. That's me, I'm the active character. All right, delayed abilities. So we remove one time token from each card and resolve any abilities triggered by a time token. Well, there are none. Obviously, no time tokens are on any combat cards yet. We haven't even played any. Um, and then you play cards or receive an opportunity attack. So if you don't play a card, like I said before, this thing is going to run away and we lose the encounter. But this is scripted in the tutorial here. We're going to walk through it step by step. And let's see. Nothing to apologize for. These videos are the only thing keeping me sane until I get the game. A uh, little gasp of air while drowning in the ocean of waiting. But a little side story. I got a mean, mean, like, it wasn't targeted at me directly, but someone basically ranted to me uh, in, like, a private message or whatever I saw that basically said they were super mad that they were too late on the Kickstarter, and they were kind of upset that they got told it was too late, and they'd emailed, like, customer support, and they said, sorry, you missed it. And then he found out that I like basically requested it like recently and I got one. And so he was like, just like kind of very mad. And I was like, oh, like, <laughs> so I feel bad. I was like, I don't know, but I thought I'm supposed to be showing this game off so we can grow the community and get more people behind it. And the more people playing this means the more content that's created for it. And this, you know, this game, they'll make more games like this. Right. So in my mind, I'm trying to do a good thing here, but yeah, some, some negative comments lately kind of like really surprised me uh, for having this game. It seems very very strange. I guess it's very sought after. Like, I know the hype behind this game is huge, but it's like, come on, man. Be happy people are, are sharing the game. Uh, but anyways, rant done. All right. So let's see here. Uh, so no enemy traits. You can also ignore delayed ability step. 
Now time to fight. Play the attack card. So how this works, let's walk through it here. So we're going to play the attack card. And it says, attaches to the right edge of the encounter card as seen above. This causes both halves of the aggression key, which is the bear heads here. Um, so the bear head here, it's going to connect. So let's show this here. So it joins like so. So how this works, these are called keys. So up here is like keys that attach to your abilities. So in this case, the bear head, which matches the bear head that's on the aggression here. So you can always, you can always look at your player board to remember the symbols, which I'm trying to memorize them without looking, but it's tough. I just remember aggression very well in Courage because they're ones that I have, I have that stat and they're in this demo. So, so for example, aggression right here, the bear head connects to this red cube on the side. It basically says, I get a red cube, it's good. If I didn't have any trait in regression, which, aggression, which I have two, so I'm good. But you can see here on this card, it's going to connect eventually, uh, or possibly could connect to another one on this other side. If there were two bear heads, I'd be fine. But if it was two of these, like, boars, or whatever that symbol is, for courage, uh, I only have one in that stat. So if there was two in that symbol, it wouldn't connect because I don't have enough in that skill. Or in that attribute, in that attribute, sorry. Uh, so them connecting here, the bear heads, just mean I get an automatic red cube. And that red cube will go to the left in the combat pool of this little vermin will build up on the left side of the cart. Down here is the free key. This always connects. So whenever I play your first card, you don't have to worry about anything on the card. You just know the free key is gonna connect. You can play whatever, any card in your hand, you're good. I suppose they all have this. So this I'm playing down, doesn't matter restrictions at all. I get a red cube from the bear head connecting. I also get a one times red cube from the free key connecting. In the middle, here's the blue key. This is the magic key. For me to connect that one, obviously these two cards don't connect on that key. But if something were to attach like this, you know, like another blue key on the right, attaches to the left key there and they connect, I don't get that bonus like this. There's still a check. This checks if I have the right aggression. This basically tells me you have to spend a magic, but I don't have any magic in my pool. So I can't get the reward if something connected there. So that's how that works. So right now we're just connecting here. It's just walking us through. We get two red cubes. Okay. Now it's saying, uh, let's see here. It talks about the whole golden key has no requirements. So you place one more red cube in our pool, which we did. We got two cubes. Now let's check the text of the attack card. So you always deal with your keys first. And I think you go from top to bottom. At least that's how it's kind of described in the rule book. So you check for those uh, ones attached to your attributes. Then you check your magic key. Then you check your free key. You do all that. You get what you need for it or don't or whatever. It, it, some may stop you from getting things. Uh, then you go to the ability. So the ability on attack is actually says when the enemy goes, that's what that symbol means. And that's why they're asking you to look at these icons because these icons all mean something. There's lots of them on the cards. So you'll get used to them for sure. They're very, they make sense, at least in my understanding at, from other games. It's like not way out there, just like weird ones like that. I was like, kind of like, what the heck is that for? But anyways, it tells you right here. So you, you'll learn it. It's fine. But anyways, uh, this is saying the, if it, when the enemy attacks, it's going to add plus one damage. And then we're going to put a time token on here. That's going to say, and basically a time token is like for a delayed effect. So we'll grab a time token and we're going to throw it on the card here. Actually, we throw it on the ability uh, around the ability is probably a good idea. So it's basically saying I can't draw a card right now, but if I don't cover this card up and I let them have a turn that comes back to me, there's that little window we passed here um, in the combat of check delayed abilities when the next character activates. So when I come around to my next character activation, if that was still there, I'd remove it and draw the card. So it's just a way, I think they do that to kind of stop you from just getting in like kind of a loop drawing cards, playing cards, drawing cards. So they put a delay on it. So it kind of delays it till the next turn. So you can't just keep going. Kind of lets the enemy get a couple shots in there, you know, like get a shot in on you. Um, so we play that there. Okay. So now we know enemy is going to hit a little harder <laughs> if attack is out. Because it makes sense. You attacked him. Now you've kind of pissed it off. He's going to come back and hit you. Pretty thematic. I like it. Uh, but let's take a look at the PDF. So the ability itself will resolve on the next delayed ability uh, step, which we talked about, unless it gets covered up first, which I think it's going to make us do right here. So let me get the PDF kind of lined up for you guys there. So we're on the right column there. Each turn, you may play only one card. 
plus as many additional cards that you can use that connect the bonus icons. This means any further cards you play this turn would require you to connect a bonus. So it's telling us to play Ignore Pain because it contains a bonus symbol, basically, that connects the Courage key on the previous card. Before placing this card, remove the time marker of the attack. Delayed abilities won't trigger if you cover them up. And you should never place cards on top of tokens or markers. So we are going to play, what did it say? It wants us to play uh, Ignore Pain, <laughs> which is cool. It's like, actually, I'm holding a sword here. And uh, so you're like kind of grabbing the sword as he's trying to hit you. And you're saying, I don't care about pain. And what we have to do here. So if you look at your hand, I could play reposition because the free key has the bonus symbol. So when you play the first card, like I said, no restrictions. Play whatever card because they always have a little free key that'll connect. But now if I want to play another card on my turn, I have to have something that can connect a bonus symbol for me. So if I try to connect this bonus symbol to like a courage and I didn't have the courage, that I can't connect it. So I wouldn't do that. This next one, I don't have any magic, so I know I'm not going to be connecting the bonus key to magic. So ignore pain. It's because I have courage. It's going to let me connect it. And I should get a free card draw off of the free key automatically. So let's see what happens here. I'm going to take away the time marker because I'm covering up the ability on the card. And let's see what happens when I connect it here. So we check this bonus key. I check this before I play the card to make sure I can play it as a second card on my turn or basically beyond the first card. And that bonus key checks the courage. I have one courage. We're good. It's able to connect. Boom. Key assembled. I look down here, this bonus one, like I said, no magic, doesn't matter. But then because I've connected it and I'm able to play this card, I get one times draw a card. So I will draw a combat card and I get powerful blow, which should be card four. Yes. All right. Now we look at the ability, which says the enemy gains a red cube for every point of damage received. So I'm basically that's replaced that whole draw card ability that replaced that whole enemy is going to hurt me more. This is the new active ability. The other one's covered. It does not exist anymore. Forget about it. It's gone unless the enemy does something to like discard the last card and kind of reveal the next one. But for now, that is our current ability. So it's telling us Ignore Pain has two other keys. We talked about the keys. I can skip all this stuff that they're going to make me blab on about. Um, so now we're, it's telling us to stop here. So we could keep going maybe if we had stuff to connect. So let's check what we have in hand. This one, Powerful Blow, we can't play. It doesn't have any of those bonus symbols on it. There's nothing on the left side, right? So I can't even play this at all unless this is my first card I'm playing on a turn. Because remember on the first card of a turn, we don't care about bonus actions. This one has a bonus action, re reposition like we said. So I could play this right now. I could do it because it does connect to the free key. So I could keep going, but then I would get, if you escape from combat, ignore the opportunity attack. So that's kind of cool. So it's a way to get out. But I don't want to get out. I want to leave this so that when they hit me, I'm every damage I receive, they're going to get a red cube back. So that, that seems like the better thing to leave. So I think that's why it's telling us to kind of stop there. So now it's time for the enemy to attack. So once you're done, the enemy will attack. In Tainted Grail, each enemy has many different moves depending on the value of the combat pool. Bjork currently has two markers in the combat pool. That's this little pool right here to the left of the card. So now we check the combat table and then it says for the attack of 0 to 2. So right here, there's a 0 to 2 in this little table here, which I showed you earlier. It says it's going to deal 1 damage to me. Okay. And Nuno, thank you for subscribing. Much appreciated. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um... But yeah, so we're going to, basically, uh, I lose a health. So we take this little T-bar uh, marker and we pull it down to the 8. Okay. Uh, so it says, move it down 1. That's not all. Yours ignore pain card modifies the enemy attack and instructs you to add a marker for every point of damage. Yeah, so it only did 1 damage. So we add another red cube, right? Boom. It's now at 3 out of 4 on this little vermin. All right, during the end of turn, you must discard until you have three cards in your hand. So let's do that from here. So end of turn. Uh, so enemy attacks, then we check readiness. So if you're playing multiplayer, you if each party member has been activated. So when you're playing multiplayer, uh, I would basically, as soon as I activate, way back up here on, uh, where is it? Number one, pick active character. I would normally throw a time token 
on my character. I don't know where I would put it that I can actually see it, but that's going to blend in for sure. Maybe on the ability or his name or something. Anyways, similar to, yes, probably a bad comparison to compare these two games, but Funkoverse has the same kind of mechanic where you put a little token on your character to show he's expended, and then once all of them are expended, so that's what you're checking readiness, because once I go, then it goes to another player, and once they go, they put a time token on their character. So every turn we go, a player attacks, enemy attacks, check to see if anyone else needs to go. If somebody doesn't have a time token on them, boom, they get to go. And you can choose the order, and I think that's how you'll work. So you connect cards. So like when I'm playing with Mel, I'm going to want to play cards here that will also benefit her to connect her cards to it. And also abilities that she may cover up. And that draw a card, if I left that for her, and I put the time token on it, so if this was the one I left out here, put a time token on it, I don't get to draw the card on that turn. Let's say I stop there. It stays like that. That's the last card showing. The time token's there. It goes check readiness. So enemy would attack. Then check readiness. I would see Mel doesn't have a time token, so she gets to go. So she activates. Then we do delayed abilities. She would get to remove this and actually draw the card off it, which is kind of cool. So I could like throw her an extra card to help her find something that will connect to this. So we kind of... This like blows my mind, this whole idea of working together with your decks, similar to Gloomhaven. I know it's very similar to Gloomhaven, but I love that whole tweaking your deck. And in this, you can tweak your deck at the end of every day. So you can add more cards to it and that, and then work with the other people in your party and kind of like figure out, and I assume we'll get a synergy going where we know like, I'm gonna play this card to try to get this combo going so that you play this card, but you're also just drawing off your deck. So you're also trying to dig it and tutor and stuff for cards. So this whole little mini game is like, I'm already in love. Like, I cannot wait to play this with more than one person. But even just trying to manage your own deck seems super cool. And I look forward to playing this, trying this out solo too. But yeah, that's me. Uh, yeah, I like this game already, guys. Uh, okay, so uh, so the time token's gone. We're not dealing with that. But anyways, that's just my little side rant of how it works when you're playing multiplayer uh, with this whole time token thing. So that's what checking readiness is for. That's why I was talking about that because if each party uh, has not been activated... You go to so if they're all activated, then you jump down to phase three, which is actually wraps up the turn. So then you discard each party member discards down to three combat cards, which we are only at two, so we're good there. We don't need to discard, and then you draw each party member draws one combat card. So boom, we got battle cry. So to play this one uh, first, I can play it just go nuts. But if I want to play it as a second, third, or fourth card or whatever. Uh, I have to make sure it connects to whatever, which is on the courage line here. Yeah, because obviously, yeah, that makes sense. There's only three attributes, aggression, courage, and the next one is practicality. But it's not even in my deck. That's something I'm not really, not really my thing, I guess. But so you could just, I'm sure I'll get used to the lines here. So once you get used to playing the game, you know, then magic's next, then freakies, um, which is kind of cool. Oh, yeah, right here. There's practicality. So you always know they line up. So you just kind of know, like, I'm looking... I know without even looking down on the board, the second row is courage. So do, does there a courage here? Oh, there is, but I have to have two courage to connect it. So I know I can't play this card, attach to this card, unless it's my first card I'm playing on my turn. So that's, I hope I'm explaining this correctly and it's getting through, because um, I'm trying to understand it too, but I think I have a good grasp on it. I just can't wait to start looking through the deck and kind of seeing what combos I can come up with. Uh, but yeah, so we got Battle Cry. Uh, let's see what else is telling us in the PDF to do. Blah, blah, draw a card. Yep, yep. All right, part six, second combat turn. Okay, so the next turn begins. Uh, so we're looking in the right column, guys, in the center of your screen there. The next turn begins. You could finish this battle quickly by playing Powerful Blow. <laughs> so uh, Powerful Blow, we could play red, two red cubes at the top because we have two aggression, and we get one red cube from the free key. So that would be three. So it's like overkill because it would, it would add six red cubes, and we just end the fight. But this, this is not a very, very good tutorial. We want to play some more cards, right? So it's saying, uh, but you'd, oh, you'd lose some energy for doing that. Yeah, so as soon as it's played, that's what the little arrow down and then the little circle mean. As soon as you play it, you do that. But you do your your um, the keys first, then you do the ability. So you could lose an energy as stated on the card. Let's start with Battle Cry instead. Its free key contains a card draw bonus, which means you draw one more card. Which I thought was kind of neat when I first was playing through this, but then it's like, you don't keep any of these cards after the combat. Everything gets shuffled back into your deck. So, like, drawing extra cards beyond the combat is, like, whatever. But having energy means more actions you can do after this encounter's over. More exploring, 
more moving around the map, that kind of stuff. So energy is, is your actions. Like that's most important resource, I think. Um, so you have now drawn the perfect card to end this encounter. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. We got to draw a card, right? Did I do that? No, nope, I don't think I did. I don't think I did. Throw. We're looking for throw. Right here. Boom. Throw. Ooh. So throw says uh, we could play it as the first one. Um, what did I do wrong? Oh, sorry. I didn't play Battle Cry. I'm being a dummy. I'm getting all distracted here. All right. So sorry. Battle Cry gets played. So I can play it because I have like it's the first card I'm playing. We don't care about the two cards there when you normally care if it's like your second or third card. I don't have any magic, so I can't pay the magic to get an extra red cube. But down here is the free key. says one times and then draw a card. So that's how I drew throw. Okay. Now it says if the enemy attacks me, this is a current ability off Battle Cry. When the enemy attacks, I prevent one damage, which is pretty cool too. But it's saying I drew into throw, so now I have the perfect card. And the reason why is because now I can play the second card. So now I have to look for these bonus keys and, and they matter because I've already played one card this turn that was like kind of free to play a card. And I look here at the at the aggression check and it's two. I just need one aggression, which I have. So I can play this. So I'm going to play it. And it says connects there. Doesn't connect here. Doesn't connect here. Magic doesn't connect. But down here, the one times free red cubes, I get that free key ability. So boom, I'm at four. So it's saying additionally, it's free key gives you one more red cube. Perform the victory check now. So I could end my little go here and do the um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Where is it? Play one combat card from your hand. Play any number of additional combat cards. Each additional card needs to connect with that bonus icon. After that, perform a victory check. So I'm done playing cards. I look at the victory check. Four is equal to or greater than the four on the vermin. So we did it. We defeated it. So we get the reward which is a food. So I'm now up to six food in my little tray here. Uh, we'll discard all this stuff. So this guy goes to the bottom of his deck, but as we know, the decks are only one card in the tutorial. <laughs> uh, and then all this stuff uh, would get shuffled back into my combat deck. Uh, so whatever. We will just, for speed's sake, throw it all away. Okay. So your hand, your discard pile, Cards you've played, all that stuff, shuffled back into your combat deck. Okay, uh, if you want, you may play this encounter again, ignoring any health or energy losses. Familiarize yourself with combat mechanics. If you're not sure about the rules, check them in the rule book. Yes, you need to read the rules on combat, even if I were to replay that right there. Doesn't matter. I tried to explain additionally what you could do, but yeah, I'm not going to replay it right here. You got to read through the combat stuff in the rule book. Hopefully someone does a good rules video at some point. Um, for this game would be cool but there is a lot in the rule book and i feel that video would just be a lot of information thrown at you that you'd be re-watching it over and over again and i'm not sure if you catch everything it's, it's a pretty meaty game all right let's see what the chat's saying <laughs> let's see <laughs> little gas was air while waiting well drowning in the ocean of waiting <laughs> Uh, you shouldn't feel bad. It's a perk of the profession you're in. Uh, I appreciate that, Alan. Uh, pretty sure late pre pledge was open through the summer. Uh, you've put on the work, so you're able to get one of those benefits personally. Thank you. Uh, this looks must have. Yes, it does look like a must have. I get, that's what got me interested in it. Somebody mentioned to me on the channel. I was like, man, this game looks cool. Like, I don't know how I missed this game. Like, but yeah, I, I'm so glad I was able to get it. Yanni, hey, what's going on? Thanks for joining the chat. Uh, new game, nice. Yep, we're playing uh, a Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon from Awaken Realms. Just playing the tutorial scenario, no spoilers. So you can go back and watch this later, kind of see how we got started here. Um, and you're explaining it very good. Thank you, Elias. And all right, perfect. Thanks, Alan. Okay, just making sure there's no questions. If you guys have any questions, drop them below. I'll try to answer them the best I can. Uh, I've only went through the rules once, but we can bring up the rules and look through it too after. Uh, this playthrough, if you want to know more and kind of go in depth and that kind of thing. Uh, if we're curious about something in the game. All right. So part seven, ending the day. So Bior is wounded and only has two energy left. If you look at the energy track, slots marked as one and zero are red and have the exhausted sign, which we looked at earlier. So down here, one and zero are exhausted. So down there in the bottom, right there. Okay. 
Uh, let's see here. For now, you don't want Viora to become exhausted, so you should rest. So we make a pass action. So that's uh, one of the actions you can choose on the back of this order of the day reference card. So we could explore, we could travel, we can do a location action. That's one of these little ones on the front of the card. We can inspect a menu, which is free. So you can kind of flip the card over. If there's a menu symbol on it, you can flip it over and kind of look at what resources are required to relight that thing or to activate it. Um, and that's very important, like I said, to keep the map alive. Uh, so you can always look at that for free. And it also states that information in the journal for that location. So if you have a menu on there and some tokens and stuff and you don't want to flip the card, you can always quickly just look in the journal and it will describe that at the end of the journal page right after the dreams slash nightmares if there are any on that location. Then we have uh, character, secret, or item action. So on little item cards we could get, you'll see that in our playthrough. Hopefully we get some items going. I love that in games, getting items, equipment, armor, spells, all that stuff. That is in this game. It is just not in this tutorial, but some of them will have actions on them and you can spend energy or whatever to do them. There's also secret cards. So based on doing some quests or whatever you could, or some side tasks, you could get some secret cards that could have actions on them also. So I picture um, more like, it's, it seems very similar to Lord of the Rings, Journeys in Middle Earth. Uh, this game feels a lot like that, where uh, we'll just have a lot of little mini cards surrounding our player mat, where we have actions on our player mat, we have actions on all these little cards, we have skills sticking out the side. It'll just be like a, uh, like a little collage of abilities eventually when we get further in the campaign. I picture that, but you only pick certain things to go in with. So even if you have other things to the side, kind of like Gloomhaven, uh, you may have other unlocked cards and stuff, but you only put certain ones kind of in play at a time. But you could have like a side bag of loot basically uh, in this game. So that's another way you'll have actions that you can spend on your turn. Or what I was trying to get to is the pass where you end your day. You can't perform any actions until the start, uh, the next start of day. So you kind of just say, I'm done. But in this game, at first I was thinking it was really strict where one player, so you're playing multiplayer, you each take an action and then you keep, you, you, until someone passes, then you're kind of done that little turn. Then you go back to the first guy again or whoever you decide, whoever's next, you do another action. And it seemed very structured and that's how the rule book states it. it. It seems like it's a little too rigid, but it's not. In the FAQ they even, and that's how I understood it, is you can play a little more loose with, it's a, co it's a cooperative game, right? So you could let somebody take multiple actions in a row. If you're at a location waiting for somebody, yes, they can move two actions in a row because an action of moving only lets you move one space. But obviously you're not gonna move one space, go to the next player, they do something, the next player, they do something, the next player, they do something, come back to you, now you move another space. No, you're trying to solve a puzzle here and get things done. And if somebody needs to get something done, and then get over to your space so then you guys can do an explore as a party, as a team, fight some monster all together, let that other player do what they need to do to get over to you. Uh, it's not gonna just end the round. So it seems a little structured in the rule book from reading it, but it is not meant to be that way. But I'm sure some situations they put those like structures in there, which I'd rather have kind of a flow of things just in case weird rule situations comes up. You can always go to the flow and kind of make sure you're following the rules. So I do like that, but um, you'll see us play through it. We'll do it more. It, it'll be more natural looking than the rule book kind of gives off is what I, yeah. I'll definitely play ver, ver loose. Yeah, ver loose. <laughs> yeah. So that's, yeah, that's how, how I'm getting it is, is that's how it's going to work. But anyways, uh, but on here, the pass action. So you could just kind of pass on your turn and be like, okay, you do a bunch of actions while I kind of wait for you, then I'll do my actions. But the, this pass action is kind of like, I am done. I am just saying I'm done. I don't want to spend any more energy. Go ahead, other characters, do all that you got to do. I'll be waiting for you before we end the day and go to bed. <laughs> uh, so that is going to say, let's see here. So we're at the end of day. So what we do is pass action, then we rest and eat. So we discard one food marker from his tray. And this is important. This is why they're saying build up food. So that will discard one food marker, then he gains a health. So we go back up to nine. Uh, and then he doesn't lose any terror as his terror is already at zero. So normally here, end of day, uh, let me see if I can get this up here for you guys. Sorry. I thought I was more zoomed in. Uh, so you could rest, which is consume one food, restore one health and lose one terror. If you don't have enough food, drop your energy to zero. If it was already at zero, that's when you lose a health instead. Then you restore your energy to full. But remember full is only as high as your health is. So if for some reason your health was down here, 
like at four, your energy can only go up to four at this point. So eating is good. <laughs> so restore it to full. If you're exhausted, oh, that's the other thing. Yeah, if you went down to the exhausted, which on him is a zero to one, if we were at one, uh, we would only restore four points of energy instead. But we are going to eat uh, food. We restore health. We lose a terror. And the energy part, where is that? That happens next, I think. Um, yeah, we restore to full. We do that. So I want to see if this was walking us through here in the PDF. Yeah, it says restore energy to full is the next thing. Move the marker on the energy track back to six. Uh, you don't have any experience points, so you can't advance your character, which would be here. Advance your character by spending experience. Don't have any yet. We are noobs. Um, and you also don't have any upgrade cards to modify your decks with. So we haven't got any advancement uh, combat cards or diplomacy cards, which at this point at the end of the day, if you've earned any cards, uh, or which you've purchased cards with experience, you would then be able to sit there and like modify your deck, which I cannot wait to do. I think that's so cool. It's a little deck building aspect to the game. Um, and if you're in a location with the eyeball -y symbol, uh, which is this guy right there, you'll read the dream. But if you're going insane, you'll read the nightmare instead, which <laughs> I love that mechanic. Uh, then you start the next day. Okay, so let's finish this up here. It's saying you're in a location with the dream symbol. So in a normal game, you would now open uh, the exploration journal of this location and look for the dream. In this tutorial, read the dream from the tutorial journal instead. Remember to look at the correct section of the tutorial journal, 102 Hunter's Grove. Dreams contain both story text and rules. Remember to apply this dream's rules, which are lose in energy. After you read the dream, the new day begins. So let's read the dream. which is right here, Hunter's Grove 102, dream sequence in like a gray box with a little eyeball symbol right on it, so easy peasy. Um, there is also some information here on the back of the card if we were to explore, we're gonna skip that. Uh, so, dream. In your dream, you return to the dark ravine deep in the grove. Like many others, you search for a little girl who went missing in Kunat. Instead, you find a mass of what looked like tangled black snakes crawling across the moss-covered stone. The mass rises on countless black legs and rushes at you. This is a nightmare, not a dream. <laughs> uh, for a split second, you see the horrific truth. What charges is a malformed, overgrown, beating heart on countless legs of blackened veins and arteries. It opens its circular maw full of lamprey-like teeth. Next moment, it's on top of you, ripping in your side and trying desperately to put yourself in your chest. With all your strength, you pull it away from the wound. Throw it to the ground, hold it in place with your boot, and crush it with a swing from your hammer. Then, you wake up, alone in the forest, shivering. The wound burns again. You ask the village priestess and her herbalist. You tried many remedies and quaffed foul-smelling mixtures. Still, the wound festers, turning black. You try to fall asleep, but your mind dwells on what fate awaits you, and whether a thing like the one that killed you will emerge from your chest once you die. <laughs> So he's got this wound, and uh, I guess, I don't know, we'll find out what this mystery wound is during the story. That's kind of cool, but that's his thing. He's got this, like, festering wound. He doesn't, we don't know how he got it, but it's hinting at it in dreams here. It, we know it's in his backstory. I'm excited, and I'm sure they have personal quests and personal story uh, that we'll have to deal with. So stay tuned if we play with Bior, but I'm curious. This has got, this has, like, wet my appetite here. I love it. So we're losing energy and gain a terror. Okay, so this dream was no dream at all. Or it would normally be a dream, but because he's in pain and his wound is messing with his mind. So the prophetic dream causes Bior to lose a point of energy and gain a point of terror. Move the markers accordingly. After reading the dr a dream or nightmare, continue the game. In this case, go to part 8, start of the second day, basically back in our tutorial. And there is a nightmare section there, just saying, whenever a character's terror is in the red zone of the terror track, sleeping in locations with the that eyeball icon causes nightmares instead so just some little rules text there for us which is cool uh, okay so let's see here where did my mouse go all right so part eight start of the second day on your left side there perform the start of the day just like you did before reduce the men ear dial to six and boop Oh, man, he dropped it. Boom. All right. 
read the next event card, which would normally be in an event deck, but we're going to do it from the, the uh, how to play guide here. Tired and in pain, you start the final leg of your journey. Hint, sometimes event cards have additional impact on the game. Remember to apply any rules you find on them. A little learning lesson here for us. So now part nine, enter the whitening. Travel to right location 107, pay an energy to move him. So down to four. Yes, because he lost an energy while we were sleeping, which was, come on, man. <laughs> so we go to the whitening. All right, new, no new locations are revealed, as they would be too far from Konat's menier, so they're out of range of this guy. Uh, whitening has one of those lightning bolt icon abilities, which says, draw a blue encounter when you enter this location. Uh-oh. So we need to draw a blue one. Unlike a previous encounter, this is a diplomatic challenge. A very inquisitive guard stops you as you enter the location. Place the blue encounter card face up so you have plenty of space to the right of this card. All right. So diplomacy. It's going to give us a taste of diplomacy here, uh, which is basically like combat. The only difference is on... Let's go back to our green one. The whole thing about keys connecting on the right, basically it's all the same, except for you're going to use your diplomatic attributes, like empathy, caution, and spirituality, okay? They are in that correct order there, I think. Yes, yes, and yes. Perfect. Okay, something I just figured out. You have the magic ones also, and you have the free keys also. All that's the same. The only real difference, there's a couple things. This little symbol here uh, is a varying bonus, so it could be different based on the level of diplomacy challenge you're on. So this one, the sample one, only has one line, but there could be up to three phases of a diplomatic challenge. So you gotta work your way down, so there could be other lines. And based on that varying ability, might be something different happening in, happening in the different stages of it. So that's why they use that kind of little wildcard symbol. And the main, main, main difference Instead of the combat pool on the left, like we'd have in combat, those little red cubes that are building up, we got this little tug of war track here where it's the red cube starts in the gray spot. And we're trying to move it up to the green, but we fail if it hits the bottom red space. So that's that's how that works. Uh, okay, so we're gonna do this here, diplomacy. So, and obviously you're using a different diplomacy deck, different attributes. Uh, and he doesn't look very diplomatic based on only having one in caution. Nothing in empathy, nothing in spirituality. So, we first start off, so we flip these cards, it's telling us to use these cards. So on the other side is the Diplomacy Overview, which is like slightly different steps. They're worded different and that kind of thing. You still check readiness, you still have enemy response, you play your cards, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, we'll deal with it. So, on this card, it's called the Affinity Track. If the marker's on top during the Affinity Check, you win. If it's on the bottom, you lose. You start it in the gray, like I said. Here, oh, it's a stage. Each stage resets the track and has different rules. So this one's called Explain Yourself. So this, this suspicious guard has come up to us and said, Explain Yourself. So we're going to try to like dance our way through this challenge and see if we can convince him to let us by. Uh, the reward is one reputation. If we fail, we lose a reputation. Uh, the varying bonus moves it one up the track. The enemy moves it one down the track, which is his response. And so that's what we're working towards here. Okay. So let's see if we can convince this guy to shut his mouth and move aside. <laughs> All right. So it's told us to prepare the two help cards. Place a little universal marker on the gray spot, like we said. Okay. And I'm sure somebody other is going to 3D print kind of like a zombicide dashboard where these cards go in and then you have a little little peg or something you're ticking down the side I, I can I, I know something like that probably already exists on Etsy based on the crazy awesome fans out there for board games that make cool stuff like that but a little red cube on a card seems kind of like 2009 but uh yeah it's still cool <laughs> still cool the whole idea of it but just feels a little weird feels like there could have been some different way to do this uh, but anyways we are going to Play I for detail. So we're going to draw our three cards. One, two, three. Should be cards one through three. Uh, one, two, three. Yep. So I for detail is card one. Has a varying bonus. And has nothing happening here in the free key. And it has the timed ability, time delayed ability to draw a card. So we're going to play I for detail. As our free card, it connects. So we have courage. 
or, or sorry, caution, caution, which is the linked attribute for courage. So we have caution, uh, which lets us do the varying bonus, which we move the red cube up one. Okay. Now it's time for the affinity check. We're going to just stop there. Oh, we need to put a time marker on the ability because we just talked about that. So we did our keys. There's nothing in the free key. So one times blank black box equals no soup for you. Uh, so we put this time card, a time token on here. So we're not drawing a card right now. We're going to leave it there. We're not going to cover it up. This doesn't want us to play any more cards. Uh, we could though, because we have the bonus card to be able to play more than one on a turn. We do have it down here in the free key. So we know that will connect always. But this card doesn't have any of those bonus icons. So you can't play show off as a second card. It has to be your first card you play that turn. So yeah, that's what's in our hand. All right, so now the opponent responds. So we do the affinity check. Yep, it's not on the top of the track. We're not winning yet. And we're not losing because it's not on the red. So the opponent responds. So we move the marker down one, like we said, for the response. So back to the gray. We're not making much progress here. Then that's the response. Now we do the whole thing where we discard the same, just like combat. We discard down to three cards and then we draw a card. Okay, we got misdirection. Holy bonus icons, Batman. So we got two bonus icons, one up here in empathy, one up here in caution, which caution could be connected. Uh, and then we have one in the magic, but we don't have magic, so that's useless to us, which makes me want to play with a magic character so bad. I probably said that already, but yeah, I'm, I'm really going to start digging, looking who's, who's the magic person out of the group. If anyone knows in the chat, let me know, because I want to kind of read that person's backstory maybe before we start our campaign and see if, uh, see if I can connect with that character. But yeah, I want to use magic. Uh, all right. What do we got here from Matthew in the chat? Speaking of insane, this may be too much of a spoiler for people, but I've been curious on what's on the you're going insane and the you're dying cards. Is that something other people would like to see? Ah, uh, if you guys stick around after I'm done this, we can like look, I'll bring up the rules PDF. We can look at sections. Uh, we can grab cards. I obviously don't want to spoil anything for myself either, but yeah, we can check out those cards. Oh, Maggot. Maggot is the, uh, the magic guy. Elias. Okay. I'm going to look into Maggot. <laughs> <laughs> Maggot can produce magic for his special skill. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely looking at Maggot. Um, okay. So misdirection uh, is what we got. So let's go to part 11. Uh, second diplomacy turn. So a new turn begins and Bior has something to take care of. So we have that delayed ability. So we got to remove the time token and we get to draw a card. So... Bam! We're now up to more than three cards in hand for the first time. So we play Misdirection as our first card. So we got Threatening Voice was the other one here. Misdirection is what we're going to play. So we don't care about bonus things right now. We're just playing it because we were playing our first card on our turn. And we're going to go down the order here. So we don't care about that. Nothing else here we're getting on the bonus side. But we do go up times two because we've connected the times two there. We'll go up two on the affinity track. Boom. We're one away. And if this misdirection card is discarded by the enemy, uh, it, we would move the affinity down one and lose a reputation as the ability on this card. So nothing good. We want to cover that up as fast as possible. But looking here, I don't see any way they're going to discard our cards. So we are good. All right. Then it's saying play threatening voice. Play threatening voice here. Uh, which we can play as a second card because it has the bonus uh, bonus action here connects to the free key. And if we had magic, we could move up the, the card one more. But we're going to cover it up. And then we play the ability, which is on 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 play effect. We lose a reputation, which we don't have any. So, But you still can play it. This is kind of cool. I read this in a book. It was like, wow, that's, that's not normal in games. If you can play it, if it forces you to lose something and you don't have it, just ignore it. Keep playing. You're fine. Awesome. You got away with something. But if you if it says pay something, if you have to pay a cost and you don't have it, like, which is weird. It's so different than other games like that. Most losing something is you paying a cost for an ability. But in this, losing, we're fine. If we had to pay an energy or something, we'd have to do it. If we couldn't do it, we wouldn't get this ability. So we're going to lose one rep, which we don't have. We're fine. And then if you have at least two aggression, go up one, which we do. Two aggression right here. So that's funny. We're dealing with aggression in a diplomacy challenge in the ability. That's kind of cool. So they cross over. Uh, I didn't realize that. So now we're done there. 
We're going to perform the affinity check because we obviously know what's at the top. So we're going to stop playing cards. We're going to see we're good. So it's now the highest law of the affinity track. This was the last and only stage, which means Bjor wins and earns a reward. Place one marker in the reputation slot. So we'll just take this marker. Boom. Because we get the reward. One rep. And that's what we got there. One reputation. So I basically... So let's see how that all went down. <laughs> so I had an eye for detail for some reason. Uh, then I did some misdirection. Didn't, didn't get me past him yet. And then I used a threatening voice, basically grabbing him and shaking him there. And that was enough to scare him out of the way, and I made it in. <laughs> That's my thematic win right there. All right. So this guy goes to the bottom of his deck. These cards get shuffled back in the diplomacy, along with the ones in my hand. All get shuffled back in. Shuffled. Okay, done. All right. Uh, and it says, if you want to play it again, go nuts. We're not going to do that. All right. We'll have lots of diplomacy and combat to do in our campaign, I'm sure. All right. Part two, enter the whitening. In part one of this tutorial, so we did the little lightning bolt ability. That was all that was there. And in this tutorial, uh, part one of the tutorial, Ephir asked Bjor to bring him a meteorite ingot from the whitening. So it's time to explore this location. So let's pay an energy, go down to three. And normally we'd flip the card, start reading there. But instead, it's in this tutorial. It's all in the back. And it is all in the back normally anyway. So we're at 107, the whitening, right here. So uh, let's see here. All right, we're just going to start reading it. Oh, this is where we have choices. It doesn't really hold your hand here in this part, and I really like that. I don't think. No, it doesn't. I love it. Okay, so it's basically, have we been paying attention to learning? So we're going to deal with this here. Uh, and I'll try to see if we can do it. So the hole is here, as always, gaping at the heart of the whitening. The white lit lichen uh, that gave this town its new name seems to grow out of it. It covers the walls of the nearby halls with a thick coat. Only close up, one can discover it's in fact a layer of small sparkling crystals, like sea salt, on the wooden post of a pier. As you inspect it, several people watch you suspiciously. You shrug your arms to show them you're not interested in their secrets. It says to go to verse 7. Super funny. I noticed this earlier when I was setting up, and I didn't read this the first time. I was very following action strictly. But if you go to verse 1 there, by mistake, because you're being a dummy, it says, if you're reading this, you misunderstood the instructions from this location's introduction. I sent you to verse 7, so you should go there. <laughs> it's like the equivalent of your hand being slapped. It's like, hey, get out of here. How dare you read verse 1? <laughs> I love it. All right. 5. Uh, we don't read 5. 7. So we're going to verse 7. There's no love lost between Kunat and the Whitening. You, should stay, you shouldn't stay here too long. So we have options of visit the village tanner, which would go to verse 9, or ask the whiteners about their menier, go to verse 5. I am going to ask the whiteners about their menier and go up to verse 5. Yes. Uh, so what that's going to do for us, it says verse 5, your questions spur no kindness. So how, I, I kind of want to like not spoil this, but I want to show you guys how it kind of works. So in 7, you see my choices there. They're bolded, so you can see them. Uh, and in the FAQ, it actually talks about... I want to read this section because it kind of matters. So in the FAQ, the official FAQ, my character traveled to location A... Nope, that's not it. I have a list of choices in the exploration journal. Am I allowed to read the cost and result of each of them before I make a choice? It says, yes, as long as the results are in the same verse. So you can't go read other verses. Any results that were intended to be secret are hidden by behind redirections to other verses or the Book of Secrets, which is the Book of Secrets is in this journal and it's at the back. So you like have no idea what you're looking for in the Book of Secrets unless something tells you where to go in there, which is kind of cool. So just trying to explain a little bit how the journal works there. Uh, so we're going to go to verse five. Your questions spur no kindness, so instead of relying on them, you approach the Guardian Menier to see it for yourself. It looks like the one in your town, but something is off. The sensation you experienced around Kunat's monument, an incredible feeling that the world is suddenly more in focus, is gone. So the rumors were true. Whitening's Menier is now a dead piece of stone. Gain one horror, or terror, sorry, terror. Going up to two. 
and one experience. Yeah, got some experience. Go to verse 7 and make another choice. So then we wrap around back to verse 7. Uh, and it says, our only other option is visit the village tanner. So then you go to verse 9. You ask around about the tanner Ephir wanted you to find and draw some strange looks. Finally, someone tells you this man moved out several months ago. Angry and confused, you reach the tannery, only to find the building abandoned and covered in cobwebs. What's going on? Was this a cruel joke? Gain one? Terror. Play and manage the madness second edition later, which is it's all about fear and horror. And Yeah, I'm getting a little confused with the, the wording. <laughs> all right, uh, let's see here. Gain part two of the surprising Aaron status. And then it says exploration ends. So we have to end it there. So we're going to get two on our little, little air, our, um, our tutorial save sheet, which is just for the tutorial, not the same. We talked about that earlier. But now I have both of the surprising errands. Uh, and then it says here, gain a point of terror, which we just did. Then mark the second part of the status on the tutorial save sheet and continue the scenario. Go to part 13, the way back. Okay. And boom. Oh, that button. Are the red cubes spreading if you'd place a fourth? Just kidding. Oh my God. <laughs> Pandemic. <laughs> Having an outbreak. <laughs> All right. I know they do feel like pandemic cubes, but a little bigger. They feel like they're bigger. I don't know if they are, but they feel that way. Uh, okay. So let's see here. The way back, part 13 on your right or in the center of your screen there. Uh, you have to go back to Connaught fast. Travel to Hunter's Grove as before. Perform a tra travel action. Pay one and move Bayor. So you can't go diagonal. No diagonal. So we're going to go left uh, or west. And we're going to use uh, energy. So we go down to two. Uh, and he only has two left. Just like the day before. But this time, Bayor wants to travel as fast as possible, even at the cost of exerting himself. So perform another travel, pay one, and move him there. So now we're in one, which is exhausted on his mat. Um, Bior is now back in his hometown, exhausted. Take a look at Bior's negative trait listed on his character tile. According to rules, Bior loses a health, which is his festering wound. Lose one health every time you become exhausted. Okay, uh, boom, he goes down to eight. So tired and in pain, Bior is ready to conclude his journey. Pay one energy to explore Kunat. So he's already exhausted. He just goes down to zero. So he doesn't gain another losing health. He's already entered the exhaustion, I assume. So he's still in exhausted state. But if he were, I guess, to leave it, then come back, you, you would take another health loss. All right. Uh, as before, go directly to the tutorial exploration journal. So we're going back there again. And we're exploring. So we're back to 101. We're on page for 101 here. And I will just read it for you. So we're going back to the make your choice section here. And we do now have part two of the surprising errands. So complete your mission requires part two. Go to verse two. So we jump to two. I think Did we already do. Oh, I forgot to read this little part up here on the other side. Whoops. That's okay. We did it though. Just explained it a bit more. I missed this little part in the top right. Uh, but anyways, verse 2. You enter Kunat exhausted and in pain, yet even in this condition you quickly realize something happened in your absence. Many sad-eyed townsfolk walk the streets and argue in small groups. Startled, you look towards the menhir, but it seems fine, surrounded by ribbons flapping in the wind. There is no weirdness in Kunat, so what could draw all these people out of their houses? As you approach the forge, you almost stumble upon the boy who usually delivered Ephir's messages. They're gone, the boy tells you. They left at the break of day. Ephir wants you to take care of his workshop. What? He left without me? What the heck? Anyways, uh, you stumble into the building only to find it empty, save for a note lying on the workbench, held securely in place by a heavy ingot of star iron. Three times you attempt to read the parchment, your eyes watering from helpless rage. It says, Ephir left Connaught without you, traveling with Lord Yvain, Fail, Obert, and Niant. They head for Camelot where they hope to find help for your town. You were deemed too weak for this journey. Not good enough. Haters gonna hate, man. 
A silent rage grows within you. Gone are the exhaustion and the pain. You leave the forge and look to the east. Somewhere there, behind the rolling mist, clouds of weirdness and dangerous trails, the Kunat champions journey on. You're sure you'll find them. Each party member gains one terror. Up to four. <laughs> so it says, congratulations, you finished this tutorial scenario. You'll find Ephir's letter in the game box. It will prepare you for your first chapter for the fall of Avalon campaign. Good luck in the bleak world of Tainted Grail. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right. So that's it. Let's see here on the PDF what's it telling us. Oh, I just closed it. Awesome. Awesome. So let's go back here. Let's see if I can get it open again. <laughs> derp a derp. Okay. Awaken Realms. I guess I can probably show you guys how that works. Uh, let's go here. Downloads. Fall of Avalon. Open and playbook. Oh, I guess I have it right here. What am I doing? Let's just go a low tech. All right. So it says, important, while this tutorial gives players a general grasp of the game, there are many additional rules it does not cover, such as parties and party actions, event cards, chapter setup, legacy locations, encounter traits, and so on. That is a whole lot of crap. Uh, and it says, before playing a full campaign, we encourage you to read the full rule book at least once. <laughs> I plan on reading it like three times total, hopefully. And even maybe setting up chapter one and kind of playing off camera to kind of get a, a feel for the flow of things so that when we start a playthrough, I'm not like completely lost. Uh, but we should walk through setup with you guys and everything to kind of show how, how setup works. Um, then it says the tutorial save sheets right here. This is what I printed off uh, for you guys. That's it. So that's all that's left. Cool. But yeah, that is the tutorial. Let's see what the chat's saying. Well done. Poor Bjor. He's missing his friends. <laughs> yes, he is. Yes, he is. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, let's just clean this up here. Uh, but yeah, that is uh, the tutorial mission. Kind of gets you a taste of the story. And I won't read it, but the letter, now that I understand what this stuff is, there is a letter in the box for Bjor. Uh, all here. I'll hold it a little further away so you guys can't read it. Uh, but it's something cool. If you own the game, you can read this. It's kind of like a backstory. It's actually from Ephir, the Forge Master of Kunat, right there. So a super cool, like little uh, war torn little paper there, or whatever. Uh, and he's number four out of character. So that's used when like breaking ties if you can't make a decision. Sometimes it'll say the person with the highest number or the lowest number, they get to go first or they get to take the item or they get the reward. So that little number is kind of important. Uh, so you need to remember Bjor is number four. And then they give you this cool little map uh, in the box. So Kunat's down here and they're heading northeast, he was saying, or east to Camelot, which is up here, which is kind of cool. But this map, it says in the book, a rule book is from like centuries ago or something like that or like a century ago so it could be a little out of date but it's just to kind of give you an idea of kind of where to go on the map so we're like we're down this area is like down in the bottom so obviously when you're playing you see the waters down here where these swords are and it, it like lines up so you know we're not really going to go much further south here everything will be kind of like north east and west kind of idea which is super super cool i love stuff like that i love getting maps with like Super Nintendo games back in the day in the box and was like, I always love that stuff. And like RPGs and stuff. That's what this feels like. It's awesome. Uh, but yeah, if you guys have any questions, drop it in the chat. Let me know. Um, oh, yes. We want to talk about the you are dying and you're going insane cards, if you guys want. They're kind of like a basic aspect of the game. And it does tell you in the rule book to kind of read them to familiarize yourself with them. So uh, I just have to find where they are. But my game still looks like this, so it's like... <laughs> I haven't figured out how to sort these cards yet completely. I did sort them all, but I just kind of threw them back in the box to bring them downstairs. And I will find an example for you guys. Oh, here we go. I found them. But this stuff's in the rule book. Like, it's like not... This isn't like spoilerish, I don't think. And they're all the same. I'm pretty sure they're all the same. So there is a You Are Dying for solo play. And then there is a you are dying for co-op. And the reason why is because it's a little more lenient in solo play 
because no one can help heal you and you don't have any help from friends. So the you are dying in co-op is a little more strict and kind of puts pressure on the rest of your party to make sure you do not die and try to help you. But the you are dying in solo kind of lets you have some more turns to kind of get yourself back into it. So we can look at that. So this you are dying, you attach this to your card if you reach the dying on zero here on Bior's health. Uh, and if this happened in an encounter, automatically you leave the encounter it, right away. You're dying, you're out. You just end the encounter right there, you're done. Uh, the sheer force of will lets you push onwards, but don't expect to last this to last long. So you attach this card to your character tray whenever you have zero health, gain one terror, and fail or escape your current encounter. You can only carry three items. Discard excess items immediately. Remember that secrets don't count against this limit. Whenever you receive any more damage, toss a dial. If it lands skull side up, you die. <laughs> so that's these dials here. They have the grail on one side. Whoops. <laughs> the grail on one side and the skull on the other. So you're literally flipping a coin for your life. So I would I would continue on there. Uh, if it lands, uh, where is it? If it lands skull up, you die. See the death and insanity section in the rule book. And then discard this card once you're above zero health. And then at the start of each day, gain uh, while you're dying, you're going to gain a terror each time at the start of the day. So this is the solo one. Uh, we're going to have two playing tomorrow. Uh, my wife and I, we're going to start out uh, just two player. And then we might have a third player join us uh, for one of the next chapters, possibly this weekend. I don't know if we'll live stream it or just kind of record it and post it later. But that's kind of the plan. We'll see if that happens. It may just be my wife and I playing through the whole campaign two player. And then we may try the campaign again, three player later. We'll see how long uh, missions take and that kind of stuff compared to Gloomhaven. But for Gloomhaven, our playthroughs of Gloomhaven, when we went through, we would go from two player to three player. Like it, I love the jump in and out mechanics there. So um, they have them in this game. So we might, player counts may change along the way. Um, then we have the You Are Dying co-op card, which you won't make it on your own. Attach this card to your character tray whenever you have zero health, gain two, terror and fail or escape the current encounter your rest doesn't restore health or reduce terror you can only carry two items discard excess items immediately remember secrets don't count against this limit put a dial with a time token next to your model and set them to three reduce this dial at the start of each day if it reaches zero you die see the death and insanity section rule book so you have like a three turn timer kind of like this for somebody to help you or else you're dead and whenever you receive any additional damage Reduce your dial by one instead, so it speeds up your death. Uh, discard this card once you're above zero health. And for two energy, you can dress wounds. And I believe this is what other characters can help spend energy on this to help you. You dress wounds, restore one health to this character. So as a party, you can help, help offset the cost of actions. So that's the You Are Dying co-op card. And they're all the same. So that's once you know it, you know it. It's not like they're surprised. It's not like they're different. You don't draw them randomly. So the you are going insane. There's only four of them. There's no solo one. Uh, out of all the dangers on this island, uh, the creeping madness is, is the most insidious. Attach this card to your character tray whenever your terror is in the red section of the terror track. Uh, your rest no longer restores any health. You have no dreams, only nightmares. And whenever you travel or explore, toss a dial. On the skull, you lose energy and continue your action. If you have zero energy, you lose a health instead. And if the grail side, nothing happens, you just continue your action. <laughs> so you're going nuts. And like you may start wandering in circles, it, it looks like, and uh, eventually losing health if you run out of energy. <laughs> That's kind of cool. That is cool. Man, I love it. I love the theme of this game. I like where it's going. I can't wait to see some of the cool surprises, make some choices fall flat on her face, win, all that kind of stuff. I'm excited to start another big campaign game. But yeah, uh, I don't really want to talk about much else to spoil anything, but I guess I'll end the stream here now. And if no one has any other questions to drop in the chat. Uh, yeah, no problem, Matt. Thanks, thanks for joining and, and uh, yeah, I hope it helps. Um, but yeah, we'll continue on. I'll put all this stuff away. I'm going to then go back, read some more, re read some rules right now and kind of go through the setup and maybe get it kind of set up on the table um, and start messing around. We are streaming Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition tonight at 8 o'clock. 
uh, in about five hours from now. So at some point, I'll have to clean this off the table and set up Mansion of Madness 2nd Edition for that live stream tonight. we got Kyle coming over playing some three-player starting around 8 or 8.30, I think. Um, so yeah, and then tomorrow we'll do the stream for this in the evening around 8 p.m. Uh, so make sure the link, uh, if you go to Rob's Gaming Table on YouTube, so go back to the, the main channel, you'll see like upcoming live streams. Click on any of the live streams you guys want to watch and, and click the set reminder button. And that will send you like an email and a notification in your YouTube mobile app and stuff to kind of let you know when the stream's starting so you don't miss it. Also subscribe to the channel and make sure you hit the notification bell so that you get all alerts for the channel so you'll know when I post videos or when we go live and you won't miss that either. Also the social media links are all down below. So I usually post on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook uh, when we're going live. So that's another way you can get notified, I guess, so you don't miss the streams. Um, if you'd like to donate to support the channel, all those links are down in the description below. Thank you to everyone who supports on Patreon. Without our backers, I wouldn't even be doing this. We, this wouldn't be happening. And thanks again to Awaken Realms for providing one of us, or one of your uh, review copies for us to play here on the channel and to uh, make people's wait for the game uh, a little more bearable, I guess. Um, but yeah, I'll see a bunch of you guys tomorrow in the chat. If you're watching this later, thanks for watching it. Um, this will be on YouTube, of course, for you watching live right now. If you joined us late and missed any of it. But yeah, thanks a lot for being here, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.